It's official, they don't make flat caps for dreadheads. <laughs> Just won't go on my head. Um, so today's video is a little bit unusual. Uh, basically, I found a couple of videos on YouTube that came from my feed. Um, and they're absolutely superb. So if you're wanting to learn about the fundamentals of your gearbox, how it works, so how it changes gear, how the differential sends power to one wheel or the other, um, or how the synchro mesh speeds up the gears so they mesh nicely without crunching when you're changing gears, check out this video, superb stuff. Like I say, they are 19, from, from 1930s from Chevrolet, um, so they're nearly 90 years old, and admittedly the, the, the tech in it's a little bit on the old side, but the fundamentals are all there, it's very easy to see. Uh, for those who know nothing at all, it starts super basic, so it's all easily understandable. Um, and those who know a little bit more, then just give it a bit, be a bit patient for the first minute of each section. Um, but I'm sure you'll, you'll be interested to see how it functions uh, in real time. But yeah, absolutely super. If you want to learn how your gearbox works, this is the video for you. Let's take the simplest kind of lever, a rigid bar working on a fixed support called a fulcrum. One end of this lever is twice as long as the other. Let's put a 10 pound weight on this end and now we'll put half as much weight on this end. Five pounds, balance 10. If we have 25 pounds to lift, we just use a longer lever. The five pounds will now balance five times as much. Let's raise the lever in the air, change its shape a little, and we have a crank. Or we can add a second lever and have a double crank. Now the short arm moves one-fourth the distance, but we get four times the force. If we want continuous motion, we need more arms. Now we have levers that turn. The larger paddle wheel makes fewer turns but it delivers more force. A paddle wheel is nothing but a never-ending series of levers. We can make the wheels stronger and lessen friction where the wheels touch each other by rounding off the edges and shaping them into teeth that will slide in and out smoothly. Now, the power flows smoothly and continuously through spinning leverage of gear wheels. Gears are made in many kinds and many sizes. Little gears, big gears, worm gears, bevel gears, and even lopsided gears. Over a hundred million gears are spinning over the roads in the transmissions of our automobiles. The transmission is located right at the bottom of the gear shift lever. Let's start from scratch and put together a model of the gears that we shift in our motor car. The shaft on the left comes from the engine. The shaft on the right carries the power back to the rear wheels. To connect these two with gears, we'll need another shaft, known as a counter shaft. These two gears carry the power from the engine shaft to the counter shaft and are always connected or in mesh. This gear on the drive shaft going to the wheels is free to turn around the shaft. We'll put it in mesh with another gear on the counter shaft. These gears are always in mesh. And keep turning while the engine is running. To switch from one set of gears to another, our transmission needs a short shaft like this, known as a clutch sleeve. It cannot turn on the drive shaft, but it is free to slide back and forth. On the sleeve, we'll mount a large gear, which we can shift back and forth to mesh with the small gear in the middle of the counter shaft. We are now in neutral. The gears that are always in mesh are turning over with the engine, but the shaft to the rear wheels is standing still. A 3,000 pound automobile takes a lot of force to start. So in low speed, we get the greatest leverage by letting the smallest gear on the counter shaft turn the largest gear on the drive shaft. 
The engine on this model is running at a constant speed of 90 revolutions a minute. With low gears in mesh, the rear wheel is turning at 30 revolutions a minute, about a third the speed of the engine, but with three times the force. The power is going through these gears in the transmission. After we've started the car rolling, we want fast pickup. So we shift into second by sliding the sleeve backward to mesh with this gear on the shaft to the rear wheels. The wheel is now turning at 60 revolutions a minute and the power flows through these gears. For higher speeds, we let the power go directly to the rear wheels. We shift the sleeve forward so that it meshes with the shaft from the engine. The power travels straight from the engine to the drive shaft. Now the shaft to the wheels is turning at 90 revolutions a minute, the same speed as the engine. But here's a problem. An automobile must be able to go backward as well as forward. So we add one more set of gears to reverse the shaft to the rear wheels. With the gears shifted into reverse, the power travels through the transmission in a path like this. We now have three sets of spinning levers for going forward and one for reverse. With a gear shift lever, we can shift to any set of gears we wish. But with all these spinning levers in the transmission came noise and wear. Experts could shift gears quietly by careful timing of the gear shift and the engine speeds, but most of us made plenty of noise until new engineering developments made possible the long series of improvements that followed. When we shifted gears, we got a clash because the gears were not running at the same speed. In other words, not synchronized. So engineers set to work to develop a synchronizer. The synchronizer works like a cork twisted into the top of a bottle. The cork will turn until it is so tight that the bottle turns with it. Synchro mesh works the same way. When we shift into second or high, the synchronizer brings the gears to the same speed before they come together. The drums won't let the gears shift unless they are turning at the same speed. When the gears come together, there is no clash and the shift is made quietly and easily. In the transmission of the up-to-date automobile, we have a powerful low gear to give us a strong spinning leverage in starting. A fast turning motor must set the weight of the car in motion. In second speed, we can change leverage to get going fast at the same engine speed. With the leverage of third gear, power goes directly to the rear wheels and we can go as fast as we want. Now every driver can shift gears at any time, regardless of speed. When the troop goes around the corner, the riders on the outside of the turn have to adjust their speed to keep even with the riders on the inside. The man on the outside has to ride a lot farther and a lot faster in order to keep up with the parade. The outside wheels must spin faster than the wheels on the inside because they have a greater distance to travel in the same length of time. When a wagon turns a corner, the wheels can travel at different speeds because each one can turn freely on the axles. And in the early automobiles, the rear wheels turn separately and only one wheel was connected to the engine. But when only one wheel was driven by the engine, it had to do all the work and it couldn't get a good enough grip on the road to do its job properly. So the one wheel drive was soon out of date. But if two wheels are locked on an axle so that they are not free to turn separately, one or the other has to slide. So engineers had to find a way to connect both rear wheels to the engine without sliding and slipping on turns. The device which makes this possible 
is a part of the rear axle. It is called the differential because it can drive the rear wheels at different speeds. The differential looks complicated, but once we understand its principle, it is amazingly simple. These two wheels are mounted on separate axles and supported by a frame so that they can revolve freely at different speeds. Let's fasten a spoke on the inner end of each axle so that by turning the spokes we can turn each wheel separately. With a bar or cross piece we can turn both wheels in the same direction at the same rate of speed. Let's get something to hold this bar in place so that it will press against the spokes. Notice that this support is not locked to the axle. It turns freely. Now we can spin the wheels by rotating the support. This is fine as long as both wheels are able to turn at the same speed. But let's see what happens when we go around the corner. With this arrangement, we cannot drive one wheel faster than the other. And if we stop one wheel, the other wheel won't budge. Let's put this bar on a pivot so that it can swing in either direction. Now, the bar can still turn both wheels at the same speed. And because it pivots, it lets one wheel turn even when the other is stopped. But if turned too far, the bar will swing around until it won't drive the spokes that turn either wheel. We need another crossbar and more spokes to carry on the job. When we stop one wheel, the crossbars will continue to push the spokes of the free wheel around. As long as both wheels are free to turn, the bars do not swing on their pivot and the wheels move at the same speed. Now we have the working principles of a differential. To adapt the model for use in an automobile, we will have to make a few changes. In order to reduce the jerky action caused by wide spaces between the spokes, we will put in more spokes. Further filling in the spaces between the spokes gives steadier, more continuous action. And changing the shape gives firm, constant contact. Now we can make the gears thicker and stronger, and we have differential gears. The edges are cut so that they will fit together more smoothly and silently. And another gear is added to share the work of driving the axles. The principle is the same. In order to turn the support and drive the wheels, we can fasten a large gear here, connected by a smaller gear to a source of power. Notice that the power is connected to the differential at the center line. We can make our model more compact by moving the gears closer together.